Gospels. And if you've seen our little lost sheep who's uh, being spotlighted, uh, you know what we're talking about. We preached actually on Luke 15 last week, and we learned that Jesus came to save sinners, which is really good news because we were all lost before we were found. And if you're not yet found, there's good news for you is that Jesus finds sinners. And today, uh, we, uh, I titled this sermon Faith Building because um, what well, we're going to see very simply that Jesus is teaching us how to build a solid and authentic faith. And if you would, please stand for the reading of God's word. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But, when the, one, but the one who hears and does not do them is like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Thank you. You may be seated. If you don't want to waste your time building a glorious house, then you should really take a lot of time when you're building the foundation and make sure that that foundation is built on rock, right? Because if at the end of building a two, three hundred thousand dollar house and you've built it on the ground and you haven't dug a foundation at all, what's going to happen to your investment? It's going to collapse in the next rainstorm and you will stand there broken and crying and the neighbors most likely will be standing there laughing. You guys know the Tower of Pisa? Not the Tower of Pizza. It is not a tower made out of pizza. It's an ornate 14th century tower with a tilt. (laughs) It's like this big old birthday cake that got bumped into by a guest. It's just leaning over a little bit. In fact, the Tower of Pisa stands 186 feet approximately in height, and it is 17 feet off center. That is a major lean, (laughs) y'all. It took over 800 years to completely finish, and today weighs approximately 14,500 tons. It's known worldwide as the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but its name is actually just simply the Tower of Pisa. But when you are leaning that much, you can't help but notice, right? Actually, when the tower was originally built, it didn't lean. You know why? Because it only had two stories. But upon the addition of the third story of the Tower of Pisa, it began to lean, and so they stopped construction for 100 years. And do you want to know what the result, the, the reason why the tower was leaning? You can probably guess. It's because they didn't excavate the soil deep enough to learn that they were building on clay. And clay is not a good foundation to build on. In fact, the tower of pizza, pizza yeah, I'm saying pizza. <laughs> it's a me, a Mario. <laughs> Mama would not to build a tower that leans, that's for sure. <laughs> Various architects came later and they tried to add to the tower over the years. And in order to try to keep the table or the, the tower stable, they made one side a little shorter. So it actually has somewhat of an arc if you look at it really closely. Then in um Later on, uh, Alessandro della Gerardesca tried to show the world the intricately decorated base of the tower by digging a walkway around the base. Uh, bad idea, because as soon as that happened, guess what? It rained, and it filled with water, and the clay that was weak got even weaker, and the tower leaned even more. And then Mussolini, everyone who know, knows who Mussolini is, was embarrassed by the tower, called it a disgrace to national pride, and attempted to fix the tower by way of a cement counterweight drilled into the base of the tower to try and pull it back. It didn't work. Why? Because the foundation is not 
solid. And Jesus is explaining something really simple in this parable. And remember, the parables are meant to teach us rock-solid realities about the kingdom of heaven. They are meant to teach us in ways that we can see it, physical realms and realities to illustrate spiritual truths about the spiritual reality of the kingdom of heaven that exists right here and now that isn't grown into its fullness yet, but is coming in its fullness someday when all those who are in Christ will enter in and everyone else who will desire to be in that kingdom will stand on the door and knock. And so today we're going to learn something really, really simple. We're going to learn how to build a solid faith, faith building 101, if you will. And the first, the main point of all that Jesus is saying is obedience is the evidence of authentic faith. Look what he says to begin. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? To say Lord means to claim allegiance to say that you are my master, to say that when you say jump, I say how high. When you say lift it, you say where should I put it down. We don't ask questions, we just do. Why? Because you are our Lord, I am your servant, I will do as you say. Mary was a great example of that. I mean, she's a virgin, she's like, um, I'm gonna have a what? A baby, that's not possible, but she says, to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done to me as he wills. There's a couple other examples. Abraham in Genesis 12, one through three, the Lord says to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Translation, leave everything that you know, leave everything that's comfortable and go to a place that you don't even know where you're going. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the nations uh, and the families of the earth shall be blessed. But the beauty and the illustration of what it means to be Lord and the evidence that the Lord was Abraham's Lord was in verse 4, when so, and it's what Abraham does, Right? It's not about what Abraham says, it's about what Abraham does. In verse four, the scripture says, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him. In Genesis 6, 13 through 14, Noah gets an interesting commission. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And then God goes on to give Noah instructions. And in verse 22 of Genesis 6, we see the evidence of salvation, the evidence of the authentic faith of Noah revealed in his obedience because Genesis 6.22 says, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Notice that Jesus is explaining the difference between authentic faith and counterfeit faith. And at first, he shows us that authentic faith takes God at his word. Authentic faith simply takes God at his word. God says to Abraham, go, he goes. God says to Noah, build, he builds. Evidencing that they believe God to be worthy of trust. And so they walk in God's word. Look what Jesus says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? What Jesus is saying is that confession apart from obedience is worthless. Confession apart from obedience is like clouds without rain. It's like lightning without thunder. It's like Chick-fil-A without chicken. It just doesn't make sense. James makes a similar argument in 1, 19 through 25. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. 
but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For when he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed by his doing. Notice a couple points about this passage. First of all, everyone is building. Everyone is building the building blocks of life. What are they? Your identity, your meaning your morality, your security, your hope, your future. Every little step that you take every day is built on the confidence of something or someone. The question is, is that something or someone a good foundation to build your identity on? Is it a good foundation to build your meaning on? Is it a good foundation to build your hope on, your future Is it a solid rock of a foundation? Because the one, verse 47, everyone who comes to me, Jesus, hears my word and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. See, everyone is building a house. Second, I want you to notice from the text that you have to work hard to get to solid foundations. Look what Jesus says. He's like a man. This is the man building his life on faith in Jesus Christ. He's like a man who didn't just take the world at its surface, which seems to be solid. It seems to be that if I just do what people tell me, if I just have these goods, if I just buy what the world is selling me, then I will be building my life on solid ground. You guys know the song? Don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. Well, it might look kind of nice, but you have to build it twice, or you have to build your house once more. No? No applause? No, nothing. (laughs) Nothing from the audience, yes. (laughs) And that's why I'm not on the worship team. Uh, 10th Avenue North, Mike, Mike Donahue, in the song Where Life Will Never Die, says it really, really well. The dark and immediate, they come so easy. The dark and immediate, they just come so easy, so I keep giving in to the things that kill me. See, that's what it is to build on the shallow surface of the ground of what we see. I'm gonna build my life on the affections of people, on what they say that I am, but as soon as they stop telling me who I am, I have no idea who I am anymore. And maybe I'll just build it on my youth, but then I'm gonna get old, and then what in the world, where will my identity be when I'm old and wrinkly and I've got gray hair crowning my head? Where will I find my identity? Where will I find my hope when the grave is staring at you in the face? Where will you find your hope when the doctor, the oncologist comes to you and says, you've got cancer? Where in the world am I going to find a solid hope that is unshakable? Where am I going to find it? God is our refuge and our strength, psalmist tells us in Psalm 46, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. That is what I'm talking about, a solid rock faith. Think about this for a second, that the whole earth is falling around you and you are standing there in confident faith knowing that God has got your back and that God is in control that is authentic faith taking God at his word everyone is building you have to work hard you've got to dig deep and you've got to lay the foundation on the rock why the third point is because solid foundations endure solid foundations endure they are not 
shaken by what anybody says. We're doing a, a Sunday school program right now. Who do you think you are? This week we learned I am reconciled because Satan is going to come and he's going to deceive you into thinking that you did this thing so you're not God's anymore and you can just simply tell him, uh, no, I am God's. He is mine. Regardless of what anybody says, I know the truth of who I am in Christ. Are you feeling condemned? Do you know that you've been justified? And Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, building on the rock is hard work, guys, because digging, laying foundations, taking all this extra time when the whole world is saying, why are you wasting your time with all of this faith stuff? Why are you wasting your time with your struggles for purity or the struggles to, to, to be a, a lover of your spouse and, and give of yourself and lead in servant leadership and wait for the Lord? Why would you want to do that? You can simply tell them, because solid foundations endure forever. And the ones that are built in a moment will be gone in a moment. It's a lot harder to pull an oak tree out of the ground with your truck than it is with a little bush. Why? Because that oak tree has been growing for years and has dug deep, but that bush has got really, really weak little roots. And if you try to pull that oak tree out with your truck, you're going to end up with an axle that is long gone. <laughs> but try to pull that bush out, you won't even know there's anything behind you. So it is with those who have a faith that's built on all of the things of the world. As soon as the waters come, as soon as the storms of life come, as soon as the trials come, they're like, man, I don't even know who I am anymore. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know where I'm going. I don't know. Maybe, 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 maybe your foundation wasn't built on solid You see, obedience is the evidence of authentic faith. Obedience is the fruit on the tree showing that your tree is good. In verses 43 through 45 of Matthew 6, Jesus has just told a parable of a good tree and bad trees. And that good trees bear good fruit and that bad trees bear bad fruit. And this is what probably one of the greatest pieces of dating advice that I give uh, out and to myself is that an apple tree can say it's an apple tree all day long, but if there are oranges on that tree, it is not an apple tree. And an orange tree can say that it's an orange tree all day long, but if there are apples hanging on that orange tree, guess what kind of tree that is? It's an apple tree. Because a tree is known by its fruit. And men and women, boys and girls, children of all ages, we are known by our deeds because our deeds reveal whether we are a good or a bad tree. And yet we want, and this whole parable is Jesus getting us out of our self-deception which is so easy, it's so easy for us to say, I'm a Christian, but Jesus is saying, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Do you do what I tell you to do, because if you don't do what I tell you to do, then it doesn't seem like I'm your Lord. Then it doesn't seem like you're really trusting in me, because if I was your Lord, you would do what I tell you. It's like a mom, and her, her child says, I love you, mom, I love you, I love you so much. And her mom's like, I love you too, baby, now go take out the garbage. I don't love you, mom, I don't love you that much. We laugh. Christ says, love your neighbor as yourself. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, I love you, Jesus, but I don't want to do anything. And I want the benefits, but I don't want you. There is no benefit outside of Christ. There is no benefit. 
Jesus is explaining the difference between authentic faith and counterfeit faith. Obedience is the evidence of authentic faith. Authentic faith takes God at his word. Taking God at his word means that God says we do. God speaks. We don't just listen. We perform the action he commands, revealing that he actually is our Lord and actually is our master. But then he shows us a second point with the second man. Because the first man, when the flood arose and the stream broke against that house, it couldn't shake it because it had been well built. Why? Because that man truly showed that he was a disciple of Jesus because he was doing the, the works of of Christ, that he was doing what Jesus asked him to do. But second, we see that counterfeit faith, authentic faith takes God at his word. Counterfeit faith doesn't. It's really simple. Jesus is simply contrasting. You call me Lord, Lord, okay, let me ask you this. Do you do what I say? Because if you really do what I say, I am indeed your Lord. But if you do not, your faith quote unquote, proves to be counterfeit and is null and void. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, it, game over, it doesn't matter. And if you don't think that obedience to God's word has any effect on your life, think about this. 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23, Saul had been anointed king. And God had told Saul through Samuel that he was to put everyone to death who he was fighting against and to destroy and to devote all to destruction. We're not gonna get into the ethics of what God was doing there. Simply, what faith is, what authentic faith is taking God at his word. And taking God at his word means doing what he says. And Saul thinks, hmm, I like most of what God's saying here. Don't like all of what he's saying. I'm going to do part of it. So this was the result and a lesson which we can learn for today. Samuel said, Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion, listen, is as the sin of divination, and presumption Presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Is Jesus full of grace? You bet. Is he full of mercy? You bet. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But is God full of justice and wrath, and truth, you bet. So why, when the Lord of the cosmos says for us to do something, would we put his mercy to the test when we say, I don't want to do that? Because he is, has every right, has every right to strip away the grace that he first gave, just as he did to Saul, to us. He has every right to do with his mercy and with his gifts, whatever he desires, to whomever he desires, whenever he desires. So Jesus turns and he shows the counterfeit faith. And this is counterfeit faith. The one who hears and does not do the words is like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Notice a few items from the text here. Counterfeit faith hears the same message from the same God, from the same pulpit, from the same city that those who are walking in authentic faith hears it. But the difference is that counterfeit faith does not obey. Notice again. The one who hears and does not do them, that's counterfeit faith. Hearing the same faith, not doing that, is like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. Notice, 
Counterfeit faith builds life building blocks just like those who are walking in authentic faith. They are also building identity and meaning and purpose and hope and families and jobs and a life. But the question that Jesus is saying, is all that you're doing built on what I've commanded you to do or is all what you're doing built on what you think is best because to do what you think is best is, is as rebellion and it is the sin of divination, and presumption is iniquity and idolatry. Why? Why? Why is doing what I want as opposed to what God wants so bad in God's sight? I mean, it's like, like practicing witchcraft. It's like practicing idolatry. Why? Because we have rejected the word of the Lord who has rejected the king of kings. We are saying, you know what? I really love your ideas, Jesus. Love your whole, you know, this kingdom coming. I, get, I love that I whole idea. The only problem is I don't get to be God in that kingdom. And the sooner we can acknowledge and become free from this idea that we have been ever given the right to be gods, we will be free to what, be what we were created to be, and that is human to be delightfully submitted to the will of God, knowing that everyone who submits to Christ will not wait for the Lord in vain, that everyone who calls upon his name for salvation will be saved. But in our sinful nature, we want to deceive ourselves and think, you know what, I'm pretty strong, I'm pretty healthy, I'm pretty young, I'm pretty whatever. Whatever. I got this. The sooner we can get off that program, which ends in destruction, the sooner we can get on the program of humility, which ends in exaltation, which ends in glory, which ends in strength, which ends in peace, and it starts, y'all, this happens every single moment of every single day in the battle of your minds, because the way we think becomes the way that we feel, and the way that we feel becomes the way that we act. And so we've got to come all the way back to our minds and start taking control of who is the Lord of my mind. Is my faith authentic, or is my faith counterfeit? Do I really do what Jesus commands, or do I give him lip service and deceive myself and the actual Lord of my life, the, 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 the king of the throne of my heart is the one true God, me. That's a tough question to ask. And it's a tough question that breaks my own heart because I don't do it perfectly either. So what is the real rock? What is the real rock upon which, notice, the first man who does God's word is founded on the rock. And then in verse 49, we see that the house is built on the ground without a foundation, without the rock. What's the rock? Romans 9.33 says, Behold, I am laying a Zion, in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4 clears it up. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passing through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all ate the same, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. They, in every step that they were taking, were saying, Lord, if you do not go with us, we will be destroyed. And we're going to trust you to deliver us from our enemies, not trusting in our own strength. See, the man who builds on any other foundation than the rock of Jesus Christ builds on nothing. <laughs> he is destined for destruction. One commentator said, whoever builds, that is, works without the necessary foundation of faith, is helpless, for he is certainly false and a liar, worldly-minded, and for that reason he will surely fall into ruin. For although the house he builds would seem to be beautiful and elegant, he is a hypocrite whose works do not proceed from faith. And so the house will be overtaken by the violent river of adversity. 
How do I know if I have an authentic faith? How do, I, how do I know? How do I know if I'm walking in authentic faith? First of all, am I obeying God's word? That's, what, that's the point. That's a simple question Jesus says. You want to call me Lord? Okay, litmus test as to whether or not I am your Lord. Do you do what I say? And most people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't, we don't even know what you say. That's the major problem in America right now. Biblical illiteracy. We have no idea how to refute what's false because we're not sure what's true. Because we're not hearing the words of truth. We're not taking the time to dig a deep foundation to find the rock, to establish our identity, to establish our morality, to establish our meaning, to establish our hope and our peace and our security. Because it's a whole lot easier to say, man, I can just get a 401k and feel pretty good about myself. The only thing, a 401k doesn't keep breath in your lungs. It doesn't uphold the universe. (laughs) So when we trade the one true living God for that which is created, it's really easy. But the trade isn't worth it. Do I have authentic authentic faith? Am I obeying God's word? Am I learning more of God's word? Do I even know what God desires from me? Do I even know what God desires me to do? Does he, do I know how he wants me to date? Do I know how he wants me to lead my wife? Does he know how he wants me to submit to my husband? Does he know how he wants me, do I know how he wants me to, to be a student? Do I know how he wants me to drive? Do I know, do I know how the, the truths of God were, God's word apply to my life so that every moment of every day I can walk in faith? Do I know God's promises? Do I know that when I walk into a situation that looks beyond me, that we can say things like Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do we know why we're so afraid? Do we know why we're so anxious in the morning? Do we know why the bills that pile up create anxiety in our heart when Jesus said, don't worry about anything? Do you not know that you're worth far more than a sparrow and God feeds them? Do you not know that every hair of your head is numbered? Do you not know that every star is named specifically by God? Do you not know that the whole world is under the sovereign control of Christ? So let's walk in faith, not being hearers only, but what? Doers of God's word, showing that Jesus is actually the Lord of our life, not by lip service, but by what we do. Do I have authentic faith? Am I obeying God's word? Do I even know God's word? Do I even know God's word? And finally, am I repentant when I fail at keeping God's word? Because if you were in the military and you didn't do what your commanding officer told you to do, you know what could happen? We take you out back and we shoot you. Real simple, no questions asked. You tried to desert. You didn't do what we said. You didn't carry out the mission according to plan. All right, who's next? (laughs) Because we've got a position open. But our Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He knows that it's really hard to walk in purity. He knows that it's really hard to walk in faith because we're so easily deceived. Because we so easily forget the truth of God's word. Why? Number one, we're not obeying it. Number two, most of us don't know it. So it's so important for us to dig into God's word. And this is a little, this is really a gut check, a really loving, tender gut check from Christ to those who said that they were disciples. He said, I don't care what you say, don't tell me, show me. When John the Baptist Sent his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the Messiah? What does Jesus say? He doesn't say, yeah, 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 look at my Facebook page. I mean, I'm, I'm just touting, touting that I'm the Messiah. No, he says, the dead are raised. 
The sick are healed. The, lo- the, the lame walk. The blind see. He said, if that's not showing you evidence of the power that I am the Son of God and the Messiah, I'd have no other evidence to convince you because what I say will not matter. And if you don't believe this don't tell me, show me principle applies, just ask any husband and wife in here or any uh, parent. When, they, when the wife or the, the husband comes to you and says, I love you, she's like, really? Really? Why are you always doing what you want and you never ask me anything that I want to do? What is she simply saying? You keep saying, but you aren't doing. Really, kid, you love me? Then why do you never do anything that I ask you to do? (laughs) Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. And if the worship team would come up, the tower, the tilting tower, the tower of Pisa, was closed until the 1920s. Why? It's pretty, probably pretty simple to deduce why that would be closed. It's because it leaned and it wasn't safe because we might get 100 people at the top of the tower and we're all taking a selfie together on one side and guess what happens? We just tilted it a little too far and we're going down. It's now the laying tower of Pisa, right? It's no more tilt or leaning. We own the ground. 